morning, everyone. <clears throat> so I understand this is uh, there's no formal invitation, so I won't do the formal salutation to the Triple Gem, but uh, I do always bear this in mind and try to refer to um, the understanding of the Buddha, some of the Buddha's language, and uh, the way it's practiced. You put these together, the way it's practiced, the way it's exemplified, the language of the Buddha, and then your own understanding, you're going to get a fairly good matrix for practice. Mm. Mm. You know, understanding, of course, you keep measuring that against the examples and uh, of those people you respect, and you look against the, what you have in the uh, scriptures, and where those three come together, you begin to feel some confidence in that. So, today, uh, introductions, so I hope everyone's settling in, and settling in is uh, a big part of what practice is about, feeling settled. It takes a while, it doesn't happen on day one. Settle down. We, we, we know we want to do that because we feel agitated and uncertain until we do that. We can't really rest. So that's also something we uh, already know. We want to rest. We want to come to a place of steadiness. And that place of steadiness, where do you think that would be experienced? Thought? No. Emotion, maybe. Primarily it's going to be your body, sense of groundedness and restfulness and settledness in the body. So well, I thought I would mention the role or the value of embodiment in, uh, in the teachings. We notice uh, the Buddha says, uh, you don't touch the deathless without mindfulness of body. Uh, practice is the four foundations of mindfulness established through the four postures of the body. Uh, his own awakening realized through coming into sitting still under a tree, breathing in, breathing out, bodily experiences. Uh, uh, and this went away for him was kind of counterintuitive because like all of us, he understood the nature of the body is to die. Uh, so how do you find refuge in something that's going to die? Nature of the body seems to be about hunger, cold, and preservation of one's life against mounting odds, which eventually you lose. <laughs> you lose the match. <laughs> How can you take refuge in this? Uh, nature of the body seems to be about uh, pleasure and pain, about grabbing hold of pleasure and ver averting oneself from pain, which you can never get enough pleasure, you can never avoid pain. How can you take refuge in this body? Uh, and so, yeah, well, there's another kind of body. Yeah. Uh, we call it inner body, the body you experience through breathing, a sense of some of vitality, something, a sentiency arising within you, mm. the ability to get tense, agitated, composed, relaxed uncontracted, that's, that's the body. That's what is meant, that experience. The embodiment, you might say. Nobody wants to be tense. Try and stop being tense. <laughs> Come on, relax, everybody. Hurry up and relax. <laughs> Your mind can't do it. Mind doesn't know how to relax. Yeah. Mind isn't about relaxing. The mind's about thinking, planning, uh, imagining, giving itself orders, instructions. It doesn't know how to switch the lever that gets them to settle. Body does. Yeah. Happens in your shoulders, happens in your belly, happens in your solar plexus, happens in your face. Ah, oh. oh, that's better. Happens when you walk one step at a time, instead of walking to get somewhere. It happens when you just learn to take one step at a time, 
raise your leg, swing it through the air, place it down on the ground, that's it. Ah. Whereas your mind's already thinking of how good you can do it, where you should do it, what's the best kind of walking path, how's the rest speed, um, what everybody else is doing, how long you should do it for, what's the point of this, whether you can get into samadhi through this. Meanwhile, your body just does the walking, <laughs> cuts all that mental proliferation. This is the value of embodiment. So it's operating through this physical form, but it's not the meat and bones, it's your primary body intelligence, the one that uh, cannot tell a lie. Uh, if you feel frightened, it tells you you're frightened. Yeah. If you feel angry, it tells you you feel angry. You know immediately, you feel the tensing up, you feel the prickling, you feel the rush. You can't deceive that. You can talk your way out of it. I'm not feeling angry, I'm just making things clear. <laughs> in a loud voice, but I'm not being, oh really, the eyes are bulging and, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sleepy, it's just that my head likes to have the chin resting on my chest, is the, but I'm not, no, I'm not dull or sleepy, I'm perfectly awake, it's like this, this faint kind of z droning sound coming through my nostrils, it's not sleepiness, it's just the kind of form of mindfulness of breathing. <laughs> Uh, but you realise what's happened. You've lost. You've lost the sense of being present, fully alert in your body, and so it doesn't tell a lie. It doesn't know how to do it because it's not a language of words. Yeah. And recognise that verbal language is our second language. We didn't come out the womb speaking. That's our second language. The first language is the embodied language of feeling safe, wanting warmth, yeah. feeling alive, feeling alert, waking up in the morning, where am I, what's going on, before the words start. That's why you can't deceive it, because it doesn't do words. It just goes straight to what's exactly being experienced. This is the value of it. It sidetracks the complexities. Mm. So clearly the Buddha was first of all uncertain how he could ever teach this. And the Brahma Sampati, first of all before Brahma Sampati asked him, he just thought, I can't, how can I get words around this? He knew the slippery track of words. And I just, it's impossible, it's going to be too much strain, why bother? And then out of compassion, out of sympathy for human beings, well I'll try, I'll try. It took him a while, it took about the several weeks, I think, or 10 days, was it? Anyway, to get to Varanasi, to see Patana, yeah, several months uh, to get there. Obviously walking, 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 walking. Ah. And that just probably all that understanding of dependent origination that he worked out just started to crystallize into these simple, handleable truths. Suffering, a sense of stressing, uh, the cessation of it, the origin of it, the ceasing of it in the path. Maybe the body helped him to digest all that understanding into a simple, compact form. The steadiness of it, the simplicity of it, the way it just keeps one step, time, doesn't know the future, doesn't know the past, doesn't know should, doesn't know what to, doesn't know what if people think, doesn't know how am I supposed to be, just walks, breathes. It's a simple medium for discharging the complexities of thought. That's why it's of primary significance, why we sit. Yeah. Often, like in America, they don't use the word meditate, they say you sit. You know, for a sitting, why we sit? Because bodies sit. <laughs> Minds don't sit, bodies sit. We walk, we stand, we recline. That's, those are body things. They act as the foundation. Yeah. Because in that, you have a powerful way of handling this runaway steer 
of the mind, grabbing it by the horns and turning it round. Stay here, stay here. Don't keep running forward, open up instead. And the mind that doesn't run forward, that doesn't run back, and doesn't collapse, opens. And the body is or a reference to the body, not the physical meat of the body, but the reference to this embodied intelligence pulls the mind back and gets it to open up. And then we have this beautiful space arises, becomes evident. Oh. Space. Not physical space, but psychological space, emotional space. Where before it was just a tangle of thoughts, moods, suppositions. So sort of like it's cleared and another domain here. So when you, as you stay here and restraining the speech faculty, you learn to use your body intelligence because your verbal is not going to be, it's going to be quietened down. Verbal body intelligence is how do you stand to feel most comfortable? How do you walk to feel grounded? How do you sit to feel alert, settled? That's body tells you that. Make, make that. So when you sit, sit with your entire experience of your body resting on the ground, from the, from the base of your body up through the trunk, the spine, the neck, the head, till it's all there. And the funny thing is, this is again, it's the kind of ambiguity of body, yeah, people's physical bodies, we can see their eyes are all there, but subjectively, it's not all there. Most people don't have much of a body, subjectively. They have a head. They have a little slot behind the eyes, and that's about it. Lips appear when food turns up. Hand reaches out where the knife phone comes within reach, or a button, the rest of it gone. Where did it go? It looks like it's all there. Another clue, another clue in this riddle of words. Subjectivity, subjectivity. The I before the am arises. Before I am, no, just I, I, this. Here, this, here, uh, before it even speaks, the moment of, like Lumpur was saying yesterday, the moment when the mind stops and opening, call it the subjective because it's definitely experienced, no object, no object, no thought, no, pro no project. Uh, just, uh. And yet it's subjectively experienced. This helps us to unravel the riddle of consciousness. Consciousness that runs out creates a world of objects. Sight, sound, touch, it runs out. Object, things I can see, things I can touch, things I can smell, things I can taste, things I can think, things I can hear, things out there. I'm in here, that's out there. How do I get that out there in here? How do I stop that out there getting in here? Yeah, there's, there's the whole nexus of suffering. Out there's good stuff. How do I get it in here? Can't get it in. Out there's bad stuff, cold, nasty, horrible. How do I stop it getting here? I can't stop it getting in here. <laughs> it's got me. <laughs> the world of objects. And I eventually become an object in my own mind, an object I get tired of, despair of, frustrated by, anxious about, the thoughts of me, my image, myself, what other people think of me, what I could be, should be, mine, was, never will be, myself as an object. The most illusory of all objects, the most ungraspable of all objects, and yet the most perniciously heavy and intense of all objects. Yeah? How is that? The world of objects, objective reality, sights, sounds, thoughts, self, impressions. And, you know, the thing we really believe in, 
and we're going to get and sort out and make work for us. And nobody's ever been able to do it. Nobody has ever been able to work the world of objects, of homes, of people, of things, of themselves, into a place of rest and peace. The world of objects measured, changeable, viewed, struggled over, grasped at, rejected, anguished over, that's what it is, the world of objects. Fettered by this, caught in this, obsessed with this, the world link does not reach the end of suffering. But to say there is no end to the world of suffering would be to go against the teachings. The world of suffering does not end in the world of objects. It ends in the subject. What's that? What's a subject? Well, it's not an object. So how can you say what it is? Because that would be an object, wouldn't it? That would be a thought. Hmm. But now, that's where you're coming from. Your subjectivity is opening, attentive. Objects arise within that, move, pass, change, stir. Subjectivity is always there. It's the basis, it's the sine qua non of all experience, is subjectivity. If without that, there's no experience, right? There's no experience unless you experience it. <laughs> Correct? So what is the experiences things? You just keep coming back to a question like that. Who? Where? Uh, and it just that's a thought. No, behind that, before that, the knowing this aspect, when consciousness does not run out, call it um, this. Chitta is the uh, Buddha's word for it, or one of the ways he described it anyway. And uh, it can run out, that it been the running out is called sankhara, activations, energies that, that throw everything out into energies that create what? Perceptions, feelings, impressions, all that stuff, busy, rushing around. That's the going out, the running out of consciousness. When consciousness is arrested, does not run out, turn back, ceases, rests. This is the end of suffering. Difficult to understand. Consciousness ceases? I'm unconscious? No, that's not it. Consciousness is not creating an object. Hmm? How do you do that? <laughs> well, we have to use uh, consciousness, a conscious experience, that's what we have. And you recognize as the objective forms that arise with that, and then the subjective aspect of it, we might call knowing, awareness of that. And uh, where does the body come into that? Hmm. Basically because in the embodiment experience you have the primary uh, and undeniable, non-conjectured, non-speculative. So it's a very direct channel. And it carries all the reflexes, the fear reflex, the passion reflex, the sexual reflex, the hunger reflex, the pleasure reflex, that jump that happens for us. The panic reflex, the grief reflex carries all that. Until those reflexes have been worked out, cleaned, relinquished, put aside, satisfied, completed, then we don't get that rest. You may get breaks in it. When today's a good day, nobody's bothering me, I'm okay, I'm on retreat. But then five days later, I'm at work and I'm getting angry again. Because the reflex hasn't been relinquished, it's just been put aside. 
And this is the kind of enigma of retreats, isn't it? You go on a retreat, bliss, peaceful, steady, calm, sorted. Five days later, you're having a furious argument with your boss or your wife or your... <laughs> what? <laughs> no, you didn't, you didn't actually finish it. To go into these reflexes that are even beneath one's intellect, one's aspirations, one's intentions, feel them. And as you feel that reflex towards being irritated, you know, he came in late, she got in front of me in the food line, I don't like the look of that guy, he's looking at me in some weird way, I feel nervous, you know. Why does she have to sob behind me? Couldn't she sob somewhere else? I have to sit on this cushion. I have to sit on cushion 192, and the person on cushion 191 is having a breakdown, and I'm stuck on this cushion for the next week. (laughs) Ruined my retreat. I didn't come here for this. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, yes, you did. You came here to understand suffering. That was on the agenda. Boom, here we go. (laughs) You never know when it's going to come. Something's going to get in there and stick its little (laughs) needle on your nerve. (laughs) Okay, get ready for it. No point in going into the splutters and how dare they and why shouldn't I, where else can I go? Translate the thought, the reasonable thought, the justifiable instinct to murder <laughs> into the emotion, ill will, intensity, bothered. How's that feel? How does it feel in your body? Feel yourself tensing up, tightening the jaw, flushing in the veins. Now, within all that, can you get down into your belly, down into your feet? Connect the hot, intense parts of your body with the calm, steady parts, breathing out through your feet. Palms the hands, relax your fingers. Relax your cheeks, relax your jaw. Stay with it, don't fight it. Just let those two modalities meet each other. The activated and the non-activated. And any very simple truth begins to be directly experienced The non-activated, the non-activated is much more powerful than the activated because that can discharge the activated. The non-activated, the non-doing is much more powerful than the doing. Counterintuitive. The non-doing, accessed, aware, held attentively, much more powerful than the doing. I tell you, this Dharma turns the world upside down. Or rather, this world has turned the Dharma upside down. We think so much it's about doing, making, having, figuring, becoming. No. The non-activated, much more powerful than the activated. Relaxing, much more powerful than getting activated. What? I tell you, it turns everything upside down. But test it. Feeling stirred, feeling aroused, feeling disappointed, feeling frustrated, where do you feel that? Feel the prickling in your veins, tightening in your skin, puckering in your eyes, tension in your throat. Okay, fine. Now beneath that, down into the palms of your hands, soften, down into your legs, down to your feet, your belly, soften, breathing out. Just stay with it. Don't make any judgments, don't try to get rid of it. Just stay to let those two modalities meet and see which comes out on top. You're going to find that the non-activated stay with, born in mind, just given awareness, just given attention, just brought to the fore, releases the activated. Isn't that beautiful? That's the way it has to be. We're looking at release. You can't try release. Release is the ending of the activation, the stilling of sankhara. The Buddha said, this is beyond the sphere of reasoning. This is sublime. 
this is peaceful, beyond the sphere of reasoning, the stilling of sankhara, the stilling of activation, the relinquishment of acquisitions, of psychologies, of strategies, of attitudes, of the past, of identities, all have accumulated, the relinquishment of that. We don't have to be anything we ever were before. We don't have to carry anything that we've carried. Relinquish it. Dispassion, ceasing, Nibbana. Hmm? Isn't that beautiful? Just to get even the trajectory of that, that message. Yeah. Even if you can only do it, even just to resonate with it. Oh, that would be right, wouldn't it? Turns this jitta away from the aggregates. Turns this jitta away from the going out consciousness, away from obsession with the world of form. Turns this jitta away from perceptions, away from feeling. Turns this jitta to the deathless. This is the release of the jitta, his deathlessness, the release from clinging. And clinging is not something you do, it's something that happens. Clinging creates you. You don't do clinging. Clinging is a mechanism that's born out of the fascination with object creation. Something to grasp, something to hold on to, something to get to, something to have, something to have an opinion about, something to be good at, something to develop a psyche around, something to get psyched up around, something to be a person around, something to have a future around. Craving, craving, craving generates that reaching out for a world of objects and they appear. We're very good at that. It's a country's trick. As soon as you reach out, they'll appear for you. The fantasy world will appear. Born out of grasping, born out of that mechanism that seeks to have. It's like the reaching hand reaches out and something appears in it. Oh, what a good boy am I. Pulled out a plum. And then you eat the plum, it disappears. Where did that go? How come we're not satisfied? How come I not want another one? Huh? Who's got the best plum? <laughs> How big is the plum? <laughs> it's the world of objects and it's just fraught with suffering. With the ceasing of craving, the ceasing of clinging, no objects appear, there's nothing to suffer around. This is the release from clinging. This is the release of the mind, the release of chitta. Subjective aspect of consciousness, the knowingness of consciousness. Any consciousness, mind consciousness, body consciousness, ear consciousness, but really you come down to it's going to be basically mind consciousness or body consciousness because they have feeling. You get the you get the references to how something moves you. This is how you can track. I'm activated. I'm charged up. I'm intensified. I'm relaxed. You only get that through body and through mind. The eye doesn't care, it just sees. The ear doesn't care, it just hears. So yeah, you know. But you want to know those activations because until you know them, you can't really say you've understood the origin of activations, what they do, where they go to, and the release from them. Until you've accessed them, you can't know them. You can sidetrack it. You can hypnotize. You know? And people want to do this sometimes when you meditate. Just going to some space where I don't have to feel anything anymore. I understand it. Yeah, I'll go there. Except you've got to come back to this. That's what the Buddha found in six years or so, going out into some space, the other side of his head, the white space behind the mind, uh, states of 
you know, neither perception nor non-perception, nothingness, infinite space. He's good at it. He was the best at it. He was Olympic. Surpassed his teachers. Did could do all that, and eventually you come out and you're back on this again. Same scenario. You haven't shifted a single thing. You just did a nice, very nice sidestep. A nice little side dance. Come back to this. It's not fun. But it's the work. And the work is the work to learn how to relax. The sankharas, the activations, the programs, the perspectives, Mm. the I am missions, the I am not missions, the I could be missions, all that stuff too and you come down to your body body is the simplest because it doesn't do complexities, it does pain of course uh, uh, so then you you know, simplest instruction I can imagine in, for meditation is be here find out what here really means for you and begin to strip away as much as you can of the furniture of the details. Get down to the utter simplicity of here-ness. Can you make it any simpler? <laughs> and a here that doesn't change, if you can get it like that. So it's not a here depending on weather, people, buildings. You know, if you can get it so it's a here that's not dependent whether you're sick or not. If you can just get it down, because the deeper you go, the more consistent it's going to be. The more long-lasting it's going to be. And what does here really mean? Location, you come to that, essentially if you start to work in through your embodiment experience. Behind the skin, behind the nerves, behind the feeling, behind the sensations, there's some sense of basic presence. That you, you know, that's what you came in on. So in the pragmatism of this, one thing we all have in common, we all got born with a body. So the Buddha as a pragmatist says, okay, that's our common ground, let's work on that. What is it that's here in terms of the body? Constantly here. Not sensation, they change, but the ability to experience and be reactive to sensation. Now, could you learn to work with that? Get as comfortable as possible. Take away as much as possible of distracting, of alternatives, of mental proliferation. Strip away whatever you can. And just what you can, You can't because you can't clean it all up in one go, but just take away what you can so you're carrying as least weight as possible. Sit in a way whereby you carry as least weight as possible. Yeah. Now if you're all bent up, you're going to be carrying weight. Just try to sit in a way whereby as much of the weight of your body comes straight down your spine into the ground. Let the earth carry you. So you carry as little as possible. And that's the skill of balance. And that's a bodily sense. Minds don't know it. They appreciate it, but bodies know, oh, just tad that way, that's about it. That's called sitting. <laughs> yeah. Here, balance, and as little, carrying as little as possible, doing as little as possible, fidgeting as little as possible, and really just means as possible, because nobody's made out of stone. So a little twitch and a flex and a shift, that's the best you can do. Second instruction, if one is removing as much as you can, whatever's left that feels good, enjoy as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Enjoy, absorb whatever feels most steady, most comfortable, most easeful, least stressful. Make much of that. Pig out on it. <laughs> You put the two together because your nature of your mind 
is uh, such that wherever you bring your mind to constantly, it begins to absorb into that, as you well know. And mostly, what you absorb into should be, could be, what I am, what I'm not, what the job, the you know, absorb into suffering, absorb into a world of objects. Try to absorb into the experience of subjectivity, presence, here, carrying as little weight as possible, knowing as little as possible, planning as little as possible, <laughs> stripping away what we can, and absorbing the quality of feeling more comfortable, lighter, less known, less predictable, less strategized, less conceptually complex, till it gets easier and lighter and clearer and more spacious. And you begin to experience something very ground, space, ground, space. You feel grounded, but not rigid. You feel spacious, but not spaced out. These two qualities support each other. You feel balanced, you come into balance, you feel grounded. You also feel, because you're carrying as little as weight as possible, you feel quite spacious. And that's meditation. Take away whatever you can, what are you left with, work it out. See if you can discharge it. What's left, what feels steadied, comfortable, absorb it, get into it, relish it inquire into it, dwell in it. That will be your refuge. That's a simple process. And naturally, you know, every simple process, there's going to be, you know, little tweaks and twiddles and, you know, memos to add to that. But, you know, I got 40 minutes. <laughs> and I, I'm good at tweaks. I can tweak all day long. But... Um, I don't want to load all that on you. I'm trying to strip it down so we get settled. And other people are going to add their bits and you're going to add your bits. And you'll, you know, you can build up. Just get a basis for practice. You know? It comes down to simple things like, you know, the person who annoys me Okay, they only annoy me like every time they cough and twitch, which is like, you know, I've counted it now. <laughs> they notice the times when they're not coughing and twitching. <laughs> Make much of that. Recognize the person who really disappoints you has to live with themselves 24 hours a day. You only get them like, four hours a day. Think yourself lucky. <laughs> Enjoy those times when that irritable husband <laughs> doesn't bother you. <laughs> Don't carry him in your mind. Don't carry a tribunal in your mind of right and wrong and, you know, where you shouldn't and how I ever get mad with this guy and what did I ever do with my past karma and stuff. Don't carry that. Just be grateful. And now I can breathe in. Nobody's stopping me breathing in and breathing out. <laughs> do your own business. Let everybody else be there to do their business and do your own. This is seclusion. And you don't find it by just physically separating yourself because you carry the world with you. You'll fill it up or something will. Craving will, clinging will. And that you can do anytime, any place. Very easy. Finger snap. Alone you can do it. With people you can do it. You can do it by emails. You can do it virtual. Opportunities are great for suffering. Option of not suffering takes a little bit of work, but the work is the simplicity, pragmatic simplicity, pragmatic here and now enjoyment and there's much to enjoy enjoy I have presence 
I have intelligence, I can listen, I can sensitize. Yeah. I have the opportunity. I can breathe in, I can breathe out. The space around my body, there's a ground beneath me, I'm here. What a marvel that is. The ordinary, the ordinary is a miracle that we don't notice because it's not craveable. You can't crave it because you've already got it. It's not clingable because it doesn't work like that. It's given. It's a given. And this is the kind of tragedy of the confused mind. What we crave is suffering. Or the cause for suffering. What we get intense about, focused on, rushed towards, is the source of suffering. When you stop craving, running towards, imagining, planning, there's already the given of presence, of awareness, of poise, of groundedness, of openness. Dwell in that. That would be my instruction. So this subjective, may sometimes translate as mind, awareness, heart, um, subjective aspect of consciousness, you know, words, 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 chitta. But note as a practice, you have this, uh, now you have a physical situation, this physical form, and the Buddha is saying you dwell within this. You'll notice everything you need to notice, everything that's pertinent to your ignorance and to your awakening is within this very embodied state. Within this body, with its consciousness and perceptions, is the arising of the world, the ceasing of the world and the path. Within this very body, with its consciousness and perceptions and feelings, the arising of the world, the ceasing of the world and the path. These are incredibly powerful statements in their simplicity and they're enigmatic. In this body? In my knee? Which part of my body? Is it my scapula, my sacrum? No, that's not your body, that's an object. That's the body you see with your eyes. This is a subjective experience of body. The body in itself, the way the body knows itself by its relaxation, its intensities, its agitation, its stress. That, the subjective. In that, you're going to find the arising of the passions and the doubt and the agitation, and the tension, and the dullness, and you find the ceasing of that. And you can work with the path of that. Hmm? Awareness, full awareness of the entire form, the experience of being embodied, extending it, and connecting what is stressful to where stress ceases, in this very embodied state. And then there's nobody doing it. You just put the two together and say, okay, you sort it out. You let the two work together and you'll find a miracle, profound realization. The unconstructed is bigger than the constructed. The unfabricated, the unformulated, the non-strategized, the non-activated, bigger than the activated. That will do the work. So whenever we get a hint of that, whatever language does, takes it to that, whatever channel you come into, 
that brings across that same message. The unconstructed is bigger than the constructed. We'll deal with that. You can access that. You can access that in your very presence now. You can access that. If you have the clue to widen, extend, give it time, rest in it, let it sort itself out, it will do it. Whenever we hear such a thing, Dhamma comes home. Dhamma is immediate, exciting, interesting, a key to a massive door of a massive fortress, a little key that will turn that. We delight, we're eager, we see there's a way. So 